Thank you, Lucille, and welcome to Grenoble, where it's always sunny. Um, uh, it's my pleasure to present to you two lectures. Today I'm going to talk a bit about uh, neutron scattering, in, uh, general sort of theory, introduction to neutrons in general, a little bit about scattering. And then tomorrow I'm going to go more into sort of uh, more technical aspects about the neutron instrumentation, the sorts of things that you would use if you decide to do a neutron scattering experiment, and I certainly hope that you do. Uh, most of the things that I'm going to be talking to you about uh, are summarised in, in these sort of key references. I actually brought along a few of them to show you, just in case you, you look at them on the internet, you're not sure which one to go. So that's the neutron uh, data booklet. They sort of go in order as well of uh, complexity. So this sort of neutron data booklet was produced by the ILL about 20 years ago now. Um, it's uh, perhaps a little out of date, but it still has a, a reasonable sort of introduction to, uh, to neutron scattering. Uh, you can download it from here, or if you really want to, you can get a hard copy book, but it'll cost you about, I think, 30 US dollars or something quite outrageous. Or alternatively, you can download it, uh, whoops, sorry, you can download it from, um, if I can get this to work, where's, where's my pointer? Pointer's not working. All right, I have to go back. Seriously, go back. Hang on a second. I'm going to start again. <laughs> and I'm going to point with my finger. That'll work. All right, so you can download it from here for free, which is always nice. The second thing is uh, this article here by Roger Pinn. Uh, it was produced uh, even longer ago, 30 years ago, but it, ha it does what it says on the box. So it, it has a, a very nice introduction to neutrons in general. It's written in a very pedagogical way. Uh, it also has some nice... some. Uh, cartoonist has made some nice illustrations through it, so it, it's a very nice introduction to neutron scattering in general. Uh, and then you start getting into some of the, uh, the more mathematical aspects to these things. And the first one, and I can't recommend this book enough, uh, it's a book by Devinder Sivia, this one here, Elementary Scattering Theory. And I have to say that this is possibly the best introduction to scattering in general that I've ever come across. It's very, very nice. Uh, it goes through it in an extremely uh, pedagogical way. And that's a very nice summary to both x-rays and to neutrons. Then you start getting into uh, some of the more mathematical, serious physics treatments of, of the subject. This one here, and you can see how well I like this book. It's very, very well thumbed by Gordon Squires. Uh, it, it goes through a very nice, it's essentially a postgraduate lecture series, lecture course that he's uh, then created a, a book out of to describe the, uh, the sort of fundamental derivations of all the equations that would you, you would use. And in, then, if you're a real masochist, uh, you go into Stephen Lovesy's book. There are two volumes of this at the bottom. Uh, Stephen is a theoretician, and he's really written it from a theoretical point of view. So if you're into hardcore theoretical physics, this is where you want to go. If you're not into hardcore theoretical physics, stick with that one. <laughs> However, most of what I'm going to say today is, uh, is on a pretty low level. Uh, if you really want to go into more detail and into more depth, then I recommend that you go into some of these others. So the plan for today is uh, firstly, uh, and if you're interested in scattering at all, you'll be able to leave after the, the third slide, is how to easily understand scattering in general. Then I'll go into more of the specifics of neutron scattering. So the first thing is obviously, what is a neutron? And I'm sure you all know, but there's a certain fundamental properties of it that I'll talk a little bit about. What is neutron scattering? What does it mean? What are we trying to do with it? What are we trying to discover? And then how to quantify it. it there's sort of no point in trying to do science unless you're trying to get effectively some numbers out at the end. You want to quantify what you see. There'll be some mathematics behind that that gives you predictive power. You know, this is a fundamental part of science. This is what we try to do. So that's what I'll be covering today. Now, the first thing about understanding scattering, and there are essentially three slides that I'll, I'll show to you. The first one, and I'm, I think you've already had this from uh, Werner Kuhs, is learn your Fourier transforms. All right, so this is an extremely important and very, very powerful uh, way or method to be able to consider scattering uh, even in your own head. If you, if you can picture Fourier transforms uh, and you can use the convolution theorem as well, which is also a very important way of combining various functions, when you Fourier transform them, if you take a convolution in real space or a convolution in one space, I should say, that becomes the multiplication of the Fourier transform of these two functions. Uh, and that's an extremely powerful way of taking something in real space, some arrangement of atoms or objects in real space, being able to build in your head uh, some sort of picture of how these things all look. If you know the Fourier transforms of all these different functions, you use the convolution theorem, you can see how that would, see, you see how that would appear 
when you do a scattering experiment. And it works in the opposite way as well. So if you do a scattering experiment and you see some features that you don't quite understand, if you're able to somehow decompose those into various functions that make sense, you use Fourier transforms and the convolution theorem, you can work back into real space and you can then picture what your actual object that you're scattering from might look like. So this is extremely important. The second thing, very important, particularly with, uh, with neutron scattering, is uh, learn to work with vectors. So vector is a, a mathematical object that has magnitude and direction. So here are two vectors, A and B. Uh, you don't need to go into a great deal of complicated vector arithmetic or calculus or anything like that. But if you just learn how to manipulate vectors, for example, if you add the two vectors, you add them head to tail. You start from some origin, you put A, and then you put B starting from the end of A, and you'll end up with your final vector, A plus B. Uh, and if you subtract them, then you take whichever vector, in this case B, you switch its direction, and again you add them head to tail, and then you're able to sort of take these vectors. This becomes extremely important uh, in neutron scattering. You're able to take these vectors, and you're, you're, able, you're able to work out where you're looking in reciprocal space and what it physically means. So magnitude and direction, like this fellow here, if you're a fan of uh, Despicable Me. Vector. The third thing is to learn and understand Bragg's Law. All right, now this, you can go a very, very long way in scattering just by understanding Bragg's Law. All right, very straightforward and extremely elegant representation. I'm not going to go into a great deal of derivation today. I hope that you would have uh, already done it already. And if you haven't, then I'm sure you will get it ad nauseum for about the next three or four weeks. Uh, so just very, very simply, you have uh, the D spacing between planes inside your material or a length scale inside your material. You have the wavelength of the radiation that you're, uh, uh, that you're using. And you've got the scattering angle related by this sign of the angle. And now normally th there is actually an M lambda in here. And for the most part, we ignore the M. I said we forget about, we never forget about it, but we ignore the M for most of these things. However, if you use this type of uh, relation and you keep that in mind, uh, then you're able to go a very, very long way in scattering. All right, that's it. So if you're interested in scattering, you may not leave. Uh, don't. Um, okay, now I will talk about neutrons. Right, so what is a neutron? Uh, I'm sure you're aware that a neutron is a, a subatomic particle. It's found typically in the nucleus along with protons. They have about the same mass. The neutron is very, very slightly heavier. Uh, an interesting thing, in fact, a neutron on its own is not a stable particle. It will radioactively decay and become a proton and an electron at some point. So if you like, the neutron has the combined weight of the uh, proton plus the electron. Uh, neutrons, uh, they have a, a rest mass here. It's about the same as, as the mass of hydrogen, which obviously is one proton with one electron around it. Very, very small. So if you think about the size of an atom, it's about 10 to the minus 10 of a meter. You know, some people talk about angstroms, or you can t talk about tenths of nanometers. A neutron is about five orders of magnitude smaller than that. So it's extremely small. It has no charge, hence the neut in neutron. It was a neutral charged particle. But it does have something called a spin, right? A spin is an angular momentum. You can think about it classically as if it was a top. Right? Quantum mechanically it's different, but you can think about it classically as if it was a top and it would be rotating around some sort of axis. The spin is defined uh, in quantum physics as minus a half. This turns out to be very important. Now this spin gives the neutron a magnetic moment. And the magnetic moment is very small. I've written the number down the bottom there. Uh, as an electron also has a spin on it. Uh, and it has a magnetic moment associated with the spin. But the magnetic moment on the neutron is about one one thousandth the size of that magnetic moment. So again, it's very small. But this is very, very important because that means that the neutron magnetic moment will interact with the magnetism inside the sample. Uh, so it's a very powerful tool, uh, probe, for looking at magnetic structures and magnetic properties of your sample. Uh, it was discovered uh, by this gentleman, James Chadwick, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the 1930s. Very famously, he never smiled in photos, apparently, uh, even on his wedding day. Apparently, he never smiled in photos. Uh, and this shows sort of the apparatus that he used to, uh, to, to discover it. He had to do it sort of indirectly. Uh, so he had a, a source here. In this case, it was polonium. You get, it radioactively decays. You get alpha particles, which are essentially helium nuclei that fly off. Uh, and they hit some target here, which in this case is beryllium. Uh, he was actually repeating an experiment that was done by uh, Irene and Frédéric Joliot Curie, uh, but they didn't interpret correctly. He did the, uh, repeated the experiment and he did interpret it. So you get something coming off this 
that then collides with a target material. This target material then produces particles that ionize inside a chamber. And you can see where the ionization goes. So it's an indirect method. You're not seeing the neutron directly, you, but you've seen where, it be, where it's been. Uh, he was able to then estimate the mass and the energy of these things, and then he inferred that it was a neutron. Uh, and he was correct. And for that, they gave him the Nobel Prize. So well done him. What is neutron scattering? Well, what we use then is that uh, we have a beam of these neutrons coming in. The beam interacts with some target. It's whatever you're interested in, right? So it can be a solid, it can be a liquid. Some people have looked at gases in the past. It can be all sorts of exotic states of matter, whatever you like. But you have an interaction of the neutrons with the target. And there are three properties that you can measure that, of what happens to those neutrons. You can measure their change in the direction, all right? So you put a detector at some angle, out here somewhere, you see the neutrons that fly into the detector. Uh, you can measure whether or not they change their energy. So the neutron can change its direction. It can also give or receive energy from the sample. And the third thing is that the neutron has a spin, right? So the neutron spin direction can change. That's an interaction with the sample as well. So those are the three things that you can measure. Uh, and the goal, obviously, is you want to know what is going on inside your sample. So from these three quantities, you infer, obviously, all those changes are caused by your sample. So from what you measure with respect to the neutron, you've got an equal and opposite reaction inside your sample, and then you can probe what's going on inside your sample. So in order to be able to quantify this and to understand this, you need to know how does the neutron <coughs> interact with the sample. And there are two main ways. So the first one is that the neutron interacts with the nuclei inside the sample, not with the atom as a whole. In principle, it has no charge. So it, it doesn't interact with the electrons, the, the charge on the electrons. But it does interact with the nuclei. All right, it inter interacts through the strong nuclear force. And it gives, therefore, information on the position of these nuclei inside your sample. And also the motion. All right, so in your sample, the nu these nuclei are able to move to an extent. Uh, so the neutrons are able to probe that motion. The second interaction is with the magnetism. All right, so the magnetism inside any material is generally dominated by electrons, right? So the electrons, are, they can be moving. If, an, if you have a, a charge that moves, you generate a magnetic field around it. So you take a, a wire, you put a current through it, it will generate a magnetic field. The same thing will happen inside your sample if you have moving electrons inside there. Uh, they generate magnetic fields and the neutron can interact with that. Uh, similarly, uh, you'll have an electron, as I mentioned earlier, it has a spin as well. And there's a magnetism associated with that spin and the neutrons can measure how that magnetism is oriented, how that magnetism is changing, how those spins are changing inside your, inside your sample. And this interaction is, is dominated by what's called dipole-dipole effects. So the neutron is effectively a magnetic dipole, and so is what's happening inside your sample, and that's the, the way it works there. But I'm going to concentrate, first of all, on uh, the, this first part. How does the neutron interact with nuclei inside the sample? All right, now for that, naively you might say, all right, it's like a, a billiard table. So you have a bunch of neutrons come in and each one is a particle and it hits a nuclei inside the sample and then it will scatter off, just like you would get if you were playing pool or billiards or whatever you like. Uh, but if you think about that, um, it, it's highly unlikely that that would actually happen, right? So the, the neutron is about 10 to the minus 15 of a meter long. And so is the nucleus inside your sample. Uh, and most of your sample is, is, is it's not quite vacuum, it's some sort of electron probability. The size of an atom is five times larger than that. And if you think about the density of atoms inside your sample, and then you consider 10 to the 5 difference in length scale, then the probability that some object of 10 to the minus 15 is going to interact with another object of 10 to the minus 15 in your sample is incredibly small. So uh, how then can the neutron, which is so small, interact with the nucleus? And for that, we've got to go to quantum physics. So this man here, who did smile in photographs. Uh, he, he postulated in 1905, there's a step there, he postulated in 1905 that uh, light can act as particles. All right, so light, which everybody thought at the time was a wave, could act in some sort of particle manner, and they come in little energy pack packets that he called photons. Now, uh, for, that for, for that work, he, he won a Nobel Prize. And so to this man, and I'm pretty sure that the only reason why that man is called the way that is is just to, convince, uh, to confuse native English speakers like me. Uh, so this is Louis de Broglie, uh, although I pronounce it de Broglie. <laughs> That's not the correct pronunciation, and this man deserves our respect, of course. He also won a Nobel Prize. He realized 
in his PhD thesis, right, and here's, a, here's something for you people working on PhD, see if you can emulate him. He realized that uh, if, if light can act like particles, why can't particles act like light and have wave-like properties? So he proposed this in his PhD thesis, and for that he won a Nobel Prize. So there's a challenge for you. Uh, so if that's the case, then the neutron, it's a particle, but maybe because of quantum physics, it can have uh, wave-like properties as well. And it's in fact the neutron wave that interacts with the nucleus inside the sample. So if you've got a wave, uh, then a wave, you have a process called diffraction, and once the wave is diffracted, if two waves meet, you've got a process called interference. All right, so if the neutron can behave like a wave, the neutrons must be able to diffract and interfere. All right, so what's the principle, what's the process of diffraction? Well, if you've got waves, in these cases, plane waves, and these can be any waves. This is just a mathematical construct at the moment. Uh, they could be sound waves, they could be waves on the sea, they could be light waves or neutron waves. You put an object in there and you somehow perturb this wave. This is a plane wave coming in. And what happens when this plane wave meets this object in the middle here, this little dot, you'll get uh, spherical waves, or in this case circular waves, that come off it. And this process of bending the wave around an object is known as diffraction. Uh, if you have multiple of these objects, each one of those is going to diffract a wave. The, the waves will eventually meet with one another, and where they meet, they interfere. In some positions, you'll get uh, waves that will, the two peaks on the waves will add, you'll get a wave that's twice as high. In another spot, you'll get a wave where the peak and the trough meet, and they'll cancel out. And in fact, this was known uh, 200 years ago. This was established, this was known before then, but this very famous experiment here by Thomas Young, he proved that light travels like waves by doing exactly this experiment. And this shows, uh, I believe this is some sort of figure from his original paper. Uh, you've got two sources of light here. He shone a light from behind, and then he had a screen over here. In fact, it looks like he even had a box. And he could see light and dark parts across his screen. Uh, and then he was able to establish that this is the effect of the diffraction of the light coming through these slits and eventually the interference to give you these light and dark fringes at the end here. So this was known 200 years ago for light. Uh, it was then uh, established that you could use this diffraction interference to study crystals when, once x-rays were discovered. Uh, here's a, an image from, uh, from Bragg, Bragg the Younger, I believe. Uh, where he managed to see these Bragg spots coming from the interaction of uh, x-rays with a crystal. Uh, and then on the basis of that, you're able to work out where the atoms are inside your crystal. Uh, he was recognized for a Nobel Prize as well. Uh, and then this was celebrated 100 years later uh, with the International Year of Crystallography, just to show how powerful this technique was. All right, so this is true for x-ray diffraction. This is all established for x-ray diffraction. X-ray is a form of light. Right, it's been known for quite some time that light can travel like waves. If neutrons can travel like waves as well, then there should be some sort of parallel in some of the properties between light and, uh, and, and, and neutrons. And that's actually the case. So if you talk about light waves, well, light waves will have a certain speed. It's generally written down at, as a C, uh, the speed of light. Neutrons ob obviously also have a speed if they're moving along. Light has a wavelength associated with that, and it has a frequency. Neutrons also have a, a wavelength and a frequency. Uh, the energy of the two objects, light and neutrons, is established with respect to its frequency. So you've got an energy here, and it's given by the frequency of these two different types of uh, object. And you also have a momentum associated with that. So the momentum here is given by the wavelength. In fact, it's the inverse of the wavelength. Uh, there's a, a, a few very subtle but very important differences. One is that photons have no rest mass here, meaning if you stopped a phonon and you tried to put it on a balance, you couldn't. Right, phonon is a packet of energy, so once it gets stopped, it turns into another form of energy. A neutron, though, you can have a station in neut uh, a neutron, and if you could, you'd put it on a balance, you'd be able to weigh the, the mass of it, and that's what you would get. This is actually very important when you start trying to plug some numbers in to work out the relevant energies and the relevant uh, momenta that you're interested in. Okay, so if you take a fairly typical x-ray, and if you've worked with x-rays in a lab, you've probably used something like a copper anode, right? So you have electrons hit a copper anode, they produce x-rays. X-rays from copper have typically wavelengths of about one and a half angstroms. And in fact, automati automatically you can see how uh, this diffraction thing becomes important. One and a half angstroms is about the size of an atom. So your wavelength is comparable to the size of your object, and that's one of the reasons why uh, you're able to get such nice diffraction, uh, if you think about Bragg's law in that case. 
You have k here, which is the momentum here, just to, which is given by the inverse of that, uh, given by that quantity there. You can set up exactly the same type of, of uh, radiation for neutrons with the same type of, um, uh, type of wavelength. Uh, but there's a very, very important difference between them. And that comes about with, rega with regard to the energy of these two things. So the speed of an X-ray, of course, is the speed of light, which is very, very fast. But the speed of the same wavelength neutron is much, much slower. It's only about three kilometers a second. In fact, that's about the speed of a satellite in geostationary orbit. So it, it's not actually that fast. In fact, these things are, if you're a physicist, these things are non-relativistic. That makes the mathematics actually a lot simpler. The second thing that uh, really th that comes out then is, is the, a question of the energies. And you can see the energy of the X-ray is given in kilo electron volts. That's, that's quite high. That means it will penetrate, for example, through your, your tissue and you'll be able to get X-ray images if you go to the doctor, you want to see your bones. Neutrons, though, the energies are much, much smaller. They're eight orders of magnitude smaller. The energy of a neutron for the same wavelength is very small compared to that for X-rays. So this is a very important thing if you want to use neutrons to do your experiment, to be able to study something in your material. If you want to be able to use these neutrons to do similar sorts of things as what you might do for X-rays, then the neutrons must be very slow. Right? They've got to be of the order of three kilometers a second, uh, and even slower sometimes, uh, in, in terms of their speed. And the neutron energies also need to be small as well. Uh, the two are obviously related. But this is a very, very good because if you start looking at the dynamics of what's going inside your system, uh, inside your, your uh, compound, the thing you're interested in, they're typically about this energy scale here. So neutrons have about the same energy as those sorts of uh, fluctuations, excitations, dynamics that are going, inside, going on inside your sample. That makes them a very important probe for studying dynamics inside matter. Now, the, the first experiments, neutron diffraction, uh, were, were done uh, back in 1936. So that wasn't long after the neutron was discovered. Uh, I think uh, 1932 was the paper where uh, Chadwick said, I think I found the neutron. Uh, and here you've got a, a rather nice type of experiment. They've used the same type of method here to generate the neutrons. Uh, I, I love this figure because uh, it's got some things like a paraffin howitzer. I like this idea of a cannon that's sort of shooting neutrons out. Uh, and what they've done here is they've got the neutrons come out there they're uh, diffracting off these two crystals into a detector. And that first experiment established that neutron diffraction would work. Uh, and then a bit later, about 11 years later, uh, there was a, a much more comprehensive experiment. Uh, and then if you've done sort of a single crystal scattering already, you'll be familiar with something called the rocking curve, which is you have a beam of radiation in, you rotate your sample, and you look for a Bragg peak. And that's exactly what they did. Uh, and you can see this nice Bragg peak here. So that, that was about the, uh, the 50s, and from about that point onward, uh, neutron scattering in general, diffraction, but also inelastic scattering has sort of flourished. And now you've got uh, places like the ILL today. All right, now the next thing, of course, is that uh, we need to be able to quantify all of this. All right, so I mentioned this earlier, that the, uh, the, the neutrons measure the count rate as a function of these three parameters. Right, these three parameters, now I can quantify them with some of the things that I've already told you. Um, for example, the change in the direction of the neutron, that gives us something called the momentum transfer. Right, the change in direction implies that you've given or received some momentum from the sample. Uh, in fact, you've received some momentum from the sample, that means you've given some momentum to the sample. Things are equal and opposite. And this is quantified through something I'm going to call Q, which is this K here is the, given by the momentum of the incident beam. This K primed is the momentum of the scattered beam. So Q is the initial one minus the final one. The second thing is the change in the neutron's energy. Right? So you've seen some mathematics already to, to tell you what the energy of the neutron is. And you can measure this change of energy inside your sample. And the third thing uh, is you, you can measure the change in the spin. So the neutron spin will change its direction, potentially will change its direction. You can measure that as well if you wish. Now with all of this, this is the type of science that you can probe, right? which is Enormous. If you look at the scales on these things, you're going from 0.1 to 10 to the 4. That's five orders of magnitude in distance. Uh, and if you look at the, uh, the, uh, the y-axis here, you've got time scales going from, uh, what's that, almost 0 0.001 up to almost uh, 100,000 picoseconds. The pink part here, that's supposed to be the structural studies. That's what you would do with neutron diffraction. You can go all the way from 
very large objects, which would be things like proteins in solutions, micelles, viruses, which would be topical for the moment, uh, right up to things like uh, high precision crystallography, looking for fractions of a, a, an Angstrom shift in the positions of atoms inside your material. Uh, you can also, the yellow one here, you can also look at the dynamics and you can go from very long length uh, time scale things like biological system dynamics. These things are moving relatively slowly uh, in, in terms of biology compared to things like hydrogen modes. Hydrogen is very light and it can be fluctuating at very, very high frequencies. These, this whole range of things, uh, this big energy scale and this big distance scale, you can cover all of that with neutron scattering if you plan your experiment correctly. One thing I would like to say, especially for the camera, is I like this slide very much and I'm going to show it numerous times, but I can take no credit for creating it. Unfortunately, I can't find, I can't remember where I got it from <laughs> and I can't find the original thing. But this is a lovely figure to just shows you the sorts of things. If your science fits somewhere into here, then you should definitely consider doing neutron scattering at some point. Okay, so with all of that, how do you quantify it? How are we going to quantify it? What you're trying to do then is measure some sort of probability that the neutron will get scattered. That's what you're trying to work out. And your sample determines what that probability will be. In effect, if you want to do this mathematically, you'll have some incident neutrons that will come in with a, a wave vector, K. That's the momentum of the incident beam. They get scattered somehow from your sample. They might gain or lose energy. And they get scattered into some solid angle. All right, so you, the, the definition of solid angle, you've got some area out here, which is effectively your detector. It's at some distance. If you work back to your sample, that will subtend some sort of angle. This is known as the solid angle. All right, so what you're trying to work out then is the neutron comes in with one energy. It comes out with another energy through a certain solid angle. And there will, there will also be some change in the spin. Your initial target state is uh, defined as this variable here, which I can't remember what it is in Greek. And it comes out as this one here. What you're trying to work out is how has your sample changed. And what you, what you then measure is the probability that the neutron scatters into this solid angle uh, with a certain final energy. Right? And this thing is known as the cross-section. Right? So the cross-section determines the probability that that's going to happen. You can define it rather generally if you go to Wikipedia or something like that. Then you'll see that the cross-section, given typically by sigma, is the total number of particles scattered uh, per scattering object per second divided by the incident number of particles, in this case neutrons, per area per second. It gives you this sort of uh, equation here. And that's the probability that a neutron beam will interact with your sample. That's what's called the total cross-section. Right? That's the total probability that the neutrons will interact somehow with your sample. But generally, you want more information than that. You don't just want to know the total probability. You want to know how many neutrons get scattered into a certain solid angle. So for that, you want something called the differential cross-section. That's the probability that the neutrons will get scattered into that particular area, in that particular direction. You also might want to know, obviously, what happens to the energy of the neutron. Has it gained or lost energy? So you also want to know uh, the final energy with respect to the initial, and then you would measure the partial differential cross-section, the number of neutrons that scatter into that solid angle with uh, a, a given final energy. And then, of course, I haven't considered the spin yet, so the, the final thing to consider is what's happened to the spin on the neutron. Has it changed direction? And for that, you would measure something called the polarization-dependent cross-sections. I'm not going to talk an awful lot about polarization analysis today or polarized neutrons today. Uh, I think you're probably going to have some lectures on this at some point. Uh, so what I'm going to deal mostly with is, is these two here, the uh, differential cross-section and the partial differential cross-section. All right, now, in, if you want to quantify this, you have to go to quantum mechanics. So quantum mechanics sounds scary, uh, but actually it's, it's not that scary. The mathematics uh, is, is all really, very elegant and beautiful. What's difficult about quantum mechanics is visualizing what's going on. Uh, but I'm not going to go into that. The thing about quantum mechanics is you're assuming everything is waves. If everything is waves, you should be able to describe how everything works by a wave equation. Wave equation is, is a very elegant mathematical form to describe that, and that's the wave equation here. So you've got some variable here which is supposed to describe the wave. That's called the wave function. Uh, and then you've got this object here, which is called the Hamiltonian, and that is supposed to describe all the possible energy contributions that might interact with that wave. And then this E here is the energy 
that, that's involved in it. So mathematically what happens is that you apply this quantity here, which is the Hamiltonian, that describes all the possible energy contributions and you find out what the actual energy of that interaction is. Now there are two possible contributions to the energy. One is called the kinetic energy, it's the energy of movement. Right? And that's a fairly boring thing, that's this thing out the front. So you know what the kinetic energy is. If you know how fast something's moving, you can calculate its kinetic energy. But much more important is this potential operator. This is the potential for interaction, and that's given by your sample. So your neutron comes along and has a certain speed, therefore it has a certain kinetic energy. It interacts with your sample, which has a certain potential to change it. And what you want to know is, what is this potential? That tells you about what's going on inside your sample. All right, so in order to solve this equation, you need to know two things, right? You need to know what this expression here for the wave function of your, of your neutron is, and you need to know, you definitely need to know what this is. That's going to tell you about what's going inside your sample. So let's deal with the wave function first, right? Happily, there are two very elegant, very simple equations, mathematical equations, to describe waves. The first one is for plane waves, right? So these wave fronts are all parallel, they're all moving in the same direction. Uh, you have a very fixed wavelength associated with this, and you've got a rather nice expression given here by this exponential that would describe uh, how the wave is moving. And then you've got spherical waves. This one's a little bit more complicated because you have to take into account that as the wave expands, then um, it's going to get weaker. It dissipates as you go further out, and that's given by this 1 over r being put into that. But those are two very simple expressions to describe uh, plane waves and spherical waves. Okay, one question. Yep. You say that the spherical waves get weaker. What happens with the plane waves? Do they also get weaker? No, because as, as if you start with a certain amplitude, you have the same amplitude out here. Uh, vertically. Well, yes, but that's taken into account because you start with something, let's call it infinity to begin with, and you finish with something that's also infinite in size at the end. So whatever you start with here, you'll, you'll finish with at the end. But in this case, you start with something that's a certain size, and as it expands out, then you get this 1 over r component, so it's going to fall off. If you integrate over all of this, which I'll come to in a minute, it's got to be conserved, of course, it's got to be the same. But as you go further out, if you measure a little bit out here, then it won't have the same amplitude as a little bit in here. So that's the thing that uh, you need to keep in mind with that. Now one thing about uh, uh, neutron scattering as well is that you can actually convert from spherical waves into plane waves. Right? If you have a source, something that's producing your waves, whatever it is, and you look far enough away, you'll start with something here which is a spherical wave. And as you go further and further out, this radius of curvature gets smaller and smaller. All right, so uh, not the radius of curvature, sorry, the, the arc, the, the sort of change in, in, the, in the curvature as you go further out on the arc. And if you consider the wavelength of neutrons, which is about 1 to 10 angstroms of that order, then you don't have to go very far before these before these uh, curves here look more and more like plane waves. All right, so what happens is if you go far enough away from your source, even if your neutrons are being created by, with some sort of uh, spherical wave or even more complicated, if you go far enough away, you can treat the whole thing like a plane wave. That's very nice. That means you can treat your incident neutron beam like a plane wave. All right, if the distance is big, <laughs> and that's important, compared with the wavelength of the neutrons. But of course, we're talking of maybe 10, 20, 100 meters between the source and where your sample might be. And the, uh, the neutron wavelength is maybe one angstrom. So of course this distance is extremely big. You can treat the incident beam like plane waves. You can say the same thing for the scattered beam. So here are your objects, for example, inside your, inside your sample. Each one of those objects is interacting with the incident beam. It might be producing a plane wave. But as you can see from this original picture here by uh, uh, Tom, Thomas Young, if you get far enough away, if the wavelength is, is short and the distance is long, then eventually these things look like plane waves again. Right? So you can consider the scattered beam as well as a plane wave. And then your incident and your final waves will look like plane waves. That makes things a lot simpler for us. So let's return now to uh, how would the neutron interact with the nuclei inside the sample. Uh, and in fact, what I want to do is put a few numbers on this. So the first thing is... Um, I'm just going to take one object, I'm going to put it in my incident beam, my incident beam is a, is a plane wave coming in like this. That one object will interact with the neutron wave and will produce spherical waves coming off it. Uh, the neutron wavelength is, is very small, uh, however, the nucleus is even smaller. It's 
You know, it's uh, five or six orders of magnitude smaller than the wavelength of the neutrons. So mathematically, it's a pretty good approximation to say that this, this nucleus is a point. It doesn't have any spatial size to it. It is simply a point. Mathematically, you describe that by something called a delta function, which is zero absolutely everywhere except at one particular point, which is where the nucleus is found. And that has a certain probability of interacting with the neutron. That probability is given by that number b. That depends on the nucleus. And we call that the bound nuclear scattering length. And it's important to say bound because what you don't want in this is if the neutron comes in, you're allowed to have the nucleus move a little bit, but it's not allowed to fly off to infinity. It's got to stay more or less where it started. It might wobble around a little bit, but it's got to stay more or less there. And then this, this works. So the potential there for the interaction of the neutron with the nucleus is given by this delta function. In fact, it's a little bit more complicated than that because the neutron, uh, sorry, the nucleus has the probability of, of scattering what we call coherently, but it also has, it might have a nuclear spin and the nuclear spin can interact. So if you want to be a bit more general, you can write something a bit more complicated. You've got two parts to this. This is the, what's called the coherent scattering length. And that's the bit that would uh, lend itself to things like uh, uh, Bragg scattering and things like that. And then you've got this interaction here with the nuclear spin. However, you've still got this delta function at the end there. And that's the important thing to, to get out of this. Now what's kind of nice about neutrons is that um, this B here, this B sort of looks almost random if you look across the periodic table. All right, here's a, a picture that shows you how this BC, the coherent scattering length, how that changes as a function of uh, atomic number in this case. Uh, so for, for, uh, for neutrons, it's of the order of, of, of 10 to the minus 15 of a meter, a femtometer. Uh, and you can see as you go along with atomic number, this thing zigzagging all the way up and down. Somewhere, I guess on average, it's somewhere around three or so. But you really have a, a very almost random variation in, in, in how the scattering length goes from element to element. And this isn't the same thing for x-rays. So for x-rays, uh, this probability of scattering is given by what's called the classical electron radius. And ultimately, it's given by the number of electrons. So as you increase the atomic number, the number of electrons in your element increases linearly. The number of electrons is equal to the number of protons inside your sample. So here, if you take x-rays scattering in the forward direction, you just get this linear increase in the probability of scattering with x-rays as, uh, as the atomic number increases. For neutrons, it wobbles all over the place. And the second thing to say about this as well is, um, which I'll come to a little bit later, is that x-rays have something called a form factor. And that comes about because the size of the object you're scattering from, which is the electron distribution, is about the same size as the wavelength of the radiation. Right? The radiation is maybe one angstrom, and so is the size of your object. So that gives you a shape dependence. That's not true for neutrons. For neutrons, it's a delta function. And this scattering eventually looks isotropic. So you get something called a form factor associated with x-rays. That means that your scattering will decrease if you look at larger scattering angles. And that's not true for neutrons. It doesn't matter which direction you look, you'll get the same sort of uh, uh, scattering probability. Another interesting thing to say about this is that this is a sort of a plot of the, uh, the coherent scattering length. And at least to the best of my knowledge, at the moment, no one really knows how to calculate this. This involves some sort of strong nuclear interaction between the neutron and the nucleus. It's an extremely complicated problem to try and solve. The best plot I can find to, uh, to describe this, this shows how, how the, the, uh, the scattering lengths are changing here as a function of um, atomic number. Uh, and those dotted lines and solid lines are supposed to show the best attempts that people have had to calculate what those values should be. And you can see it's not bad, but it's not getting every one. So in fact, if you're an experimentalist like me, all of the values for B or BC they're tabulated. People have spent a lot of time measuring these things with high precision and you go and look it up in a table. Uh, but anyway, that, that's just a little aside to that. So just returning to this now, um, there's a couple of other interesting things to say about this. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the scatter looks sort of almost uh, random as you go along. And there is a couple of uh, particular positions which are very interesting for neutrons. For example, around this region here, these are the first row transition metals, right? Scandium, titanium, manganese, iron, cobalt, nickel, one after the other on the periodic table. You're increasing your atomic number by one. 
Uh, and what you'll see then is a massive difference, particularly between manganese and iron, for two neighboring elements on the periodic table. And that comes about because of the way the neutron interacts with the nucleus. You can't see that with x-rays. The x-rays interact with the uh, electron cloud. And what you've done going from uh, manganese to iron is you've added one electron to, uh, to your atom. And that means that the difference in the scattering is approximately one divided by uh, 26 or so. Uh, so it's, the contrast between those two elements is, is very, very small. So it's very difficult with x-rays in this case to be able to distinguish between an iron and a manganese atom inside your sample. But for neutrons in this particular case, it works very, very well. This is something that you can really use to your advantage. Uh, the second thing is if you look down here at hydrogen, you've got two values for hydrogen. One is for a proton, protonated hydrogen. And the second one is for deuterium, one proton and one neutron. And you've got this massive difference between the scattering lengths of these two here. And this turns out to be extremely important if you're interested in anything that contains hydrogen, for example, uh, biology, chemistry. Uh, there's an awful lot of, uh, of, of chemistry that goes into this, uh, biological, um, even, even physics problems. Uh, then you can exploit this. This comes about because uh, the neutron interacts with the nucleus and the nuclei of a proton and a deuterium atom are different. So you get a very different coherent scattering length between those. And you can exploit that to really draw out contrast between different types of material and look at how the hydrogen is behaving. All right, so just to summarize then, neutrons are almost equally sensitive. Yeah? Uh, I'll come to that. I will say that in just a minute. So just bear with me. <laughs> uh, it's coming in about three slides, I promise. And I'll give you a shout out. So, Neutrons are almost equally sensitive to light and heavy elements. So they're very good at looking at compounds that have got a, a large distribution of, of atomic weights inside. And they're also sensitive to isotope. And you can exploit that. You can isotopically change a sample. Chemically, it might look the same, but the isotopes will look different. OK, so now we're going to start putting some numbers on. Right? So I mentioned earlier what the, uh, the total cross-section was for a single bound nucleus. And it's given by this expression here. So let's put a, 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 couple of, uh, a couple of numbers into this. Um, firstly, n is the number of objects that are scattering. In this case, I've got 1, so n is equal to 1. Now I've got an incident wave coming in. I need to work out what my incident, uh, the total number of incident particles coming in <laughs> is. Uh, so my incident wave is given by this nice expression for plane wave. And in quantum mechanics, if you want to work out what this I0 is, you have to take the modulus of this squared. This gives you what's called the, uh, the amplitude of, of your scattering. And this is a lovely function because if you take the modulus of that squared, you end up with 1. So in this particular instance here, I have an incident uh, intensity, which I'm going to normalize to 1. Right, so that's nice and easy. My scattered wave I mentioned earlier, this is a spherical wave that's coming off. And it's changed by this b. I have to include this b and that's the probability that the thing is going to, uh, going to scatter at all. Uh, and it's negative if you have a phase change. There's a shout out. So what that means is that the, you have a wave coming in and if the wave coming in has the same phase as the wave going out, b is positive. If the, if the phase gets flipped by the, uh, the uh, object that's scattering, then it comes out looking negative. There's another way of thinking about it, which is uh, in one case you have an attractive um, force between the two, and in the other one you have a repulsive force between the two. Why that is, I don't know, and I'm not sure anybody else does either. This is again the, uh, the, a question of being able to solve the strong forces between the nuclei of whatever you're scattering from and the neutron. Again, this is a, a complicated problem. But what a negative beam effectively means is a phase change of the wave on scattering. But it doesn't matter when you're calculating this because, again, you want to know what the modulus of this is squared. And again, if that's negative, you take the modulus of it. It's going to be positive. That the sign of this drops out. And you'll end up with this quantity here. It's a nice function. Yep? Can you have anything in between that is in two states? That's a complex value for B something? Uh, no. That, that's not the way that the... Um, this is an amplitude. So it's not the way, it, that doesn't have a phase on its own for the nuclear part. For magnetic, it's a bit different. But for the nuclear part, uh, then it's just a, it's a scalar. Uh, 
in the end. And it, it could be positive or negative, that's it. All right, so my scattered flux, I've, I've normalized this uh, so that if I work out the modulus of this squared, then I end up with that quantity there. Now I have to take into account A, and A of this case is the area, eventually the surface area of the scattered wave. Right, so the surface area of the scattered wave in this case is 4 pi times r squared, where r is a distance to wherever you're deciding to measure. And you can make r whatever you want, because if you multiply all of these together, you end up with a very simple expression where r drops out. And you end up with this sigma is 4 pi times b squared, where b is your coherent scattering length. Right, so this is uh, then the total cross-section. And it's kind of nice when you think about it, right? So B earlier was measured in terms of femtometers. That's a scattering length. B squared is an area. So cross-section in English sort of implies that you've got an area, a cross-sectional area. So the units of this are eventually in area. Uh, now, I need to take a pause at some point, don't I? So, yeah? The values in the data booklet are not calculated at all. They're all measured. So there's different ways that you can measure the, the, uh, um, the scattering length, uh, although that's probably a lecture on its own. Uh, all I'll say is that all the values that are written up in the data booklet or on the tables, wherever you look, they're all been measured. So someone has created those materials, they've done a careful experiment to try and quantify what this B is. For the negative, values? negative values as well, yes. So there's things that you can do to work out whether it's positive or negative. Uh, and I'll come to those actually after the break. Why don't we have a break for, for five minutes uh, so you can stretch your mind. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, then, then we'll come back in a, in a short while. Now of course, no one can really do this type of experiment, all right? Because what you're doing is, for a start, you need one single atom. And trying to scatter from one single nucleus, in fact, is, is going to be uh, very, very difficult to measure. The intensity that you'll eventually get will be absolutely tiny. The second thing is that you can't measure over 4 pi steradians. Uh, it's, uh, it's not possible to set up a detector which will let you have a beam in and then measure everything coming off. Uh, you'll always have a little hole in it somewhere, so you'll have a little bit of an error on this. And people aren't really interested in what the total cross-section is insofar as they want to know how the atoms or the objects are arranged inside their sample. So for that, you need to measure the partial, uh, well, the different, excuse me, the differential cross-section. You need this quantity here, right, d sigma by d omega. Now you've got a, a number of atoms inside your sample, or objects inside your sample. Uh, you have plane wave coming in. Each of those objects is producing a spherical wave. And you want to then move your detector around and you want to see how many of those neutrons get scattered into which direction. Uh, and for that, you sort of have to go and, and then, well, if you want to do it rigorously, you have to go and solve this, uh, this wave equation, which in general is very, very complicated. Um, but sometimes you can do it explicitly. And I've had a couple of questions about uh, uh, things like reflectometry. And in fact, this is one place where you can solve this wave equation explicitly. Uh, you've got some sort of incident wave coming in. You assume it's a plane wave. It hits an interface and it gets uh, reflected. So at an interface, you'll get a reflected wave and you'll get a transmitted wave. You assume everything is plane waves. Uh, you have a, a refractive index associated with this. What is that noise, by the way? That's really annoying. Oh, they're, they're testing the sirens. Yeah, great, yeah. There's another one. <laughs> Maybe it's not, but... Uh, so you, you, have a, an, um, a, a, you have a medium here that has a refractive index. The refractive index, if you look carefully, includes this B, which is the uh, coherent scattering length. Uh, and then by matching the waves at this interface, you're able to then uh, calculate, using the wave equation, what your reflectivity is. And that's a, a quantitative measurement. However, most of the time, people aren't doing reflectometry. They're doing something like diffraction or they're doing inelastic scattering. They're looking at uh, different sort of length scales. Uh, and in that case, you sort of had to go back to this equation, which becomes just way too difficult to try and solve on its own. But you can apply a couple of very important uh, assumptions. Uh, and if you do this, or approximations, I should say, if you apply these approximations, then you arrive at a, a very, very elegant solution 
which is incredibly powerful and quantitative. I'll come back to that in a little while. So the first assumption is that this, this potential here has to be weak. Right? So the, the probability of interaction between the neutron and your sample has to be a very weak uh, interaction. Uh, and therefore, what you've got is a wave coming in and it gets perturbed. It doesn't get significantly changed, but you get a, a small variation on what your incident wave is doing. The second thing, uh, well, okay, so uh, that uh, you assume, that, that, that's one of the assumptions. The second one is that, well, sorry, once you've done that, once you've assumed that it's a perturbation, you can use quantum physics to calculate the transition rate through something called Fermi's Golden Rule. And if you're interested in that, if you go to a, 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 some sort of a physics text, undergraduate physics text on quantum physics, you'll be able to find what Fermi's Golden Rule is. Uh, it's a very elegant solution to uh, a change in a state, a transition rate in changing from one state to another. Uh, so you can use this. Uh, and that transition rate is the probability uh, that, the, um, uh, that your system uh, is going to change as a function of time which is effectively what you're trying to do with neutron scattering. You're trying to measure the probability that your neutron is going to be scattered as a function of its time, mm -hmm. divided by its time. Uh, you also have to make the assumption here that um, everything is plane waves in order to get this to work out properly. Uh, and then if you do that, and you, you sort of go through your physics text, you'll find an, an equation here which might look a bit scary. Uh, but this is what the expression looks like here for uh, the partial cross-section or the differential cross-section uh, for neutrons being scattered into a certain solid angle, the, it's in fact the transition rate, the probability rate that it will get scattered into a, a certain uh, uh, solid angle. And you will notice that you've still got this V in here. That's still a potential of what's going on inside your sample. All right, so if you go to this equation now, <coughs> and I'm, just, I'm not going to consider the neutron spin. Uh, what I'll say though is that this part here of the equation, that's supposed to represent the neutron wave coming in. And this part here of the equation, that's supposed to represent the neutron wave going out. And it gets changed by this bit in the middle here. This bit here is to do with the neutron spin. And here you've got an initial and final uh, K vector, momentum. You've also got initial and final spin. But let's forget about the spin for the moment. So I'm not going to worry about that. So I'm going to assume everything is plane waves, which is a, a, a good assumption uh, for, for neutron scattering. And if I do that, then I've got two very nice expressions here that I've shown you already for the incident and the final waves. And if I plug this for that in here and this for that in here, that equation there, this part here, becomes something looking like that, which is a Fourier transform. And you've already had uh, a bit of a discussion about Fourier transforms. So what you're eventually looking at then is, in your scattering, is the Fourier transform of the arrangement of these Vs inside your sample. So these samples each, for example, if it's a nuclear scattering, each atom will have its own delta function. They'll be arranged in a certain symmetry, a certain geometry. Uh, you Fourier transform it, and you'll work out this quantity. And then you have to take the magnitude of this squared to work out what your scattering probability is. So the elastic, it's called the elastic cross-section in this case, is directly proportional to the Fourier transform squared of the potential. And it's quantitative if the scattering is weak, so you can use this uh, uh, perturbation theorem, and the neutrons can be treated as plane waves, which if you're far enough away from your source and you're far enough away from your detector where your sample is, that's a good approximation. So you take these assumptions and they form something called the first Born approximation. And this is a quantitative measurement, a very, very powerful quantitative measurement. You can measure this for, for neutron scattering, you can compare it directly to theory, and the two should match exactly. All right, so now if you start thinking about Fourier transforms, uh, there's something that, if you start thinking in that manner, there's a few things that, that come out that are, are actually quite nice. So one is if you go back to uh, an isolated, I said atom, it should actually be isolated nucleus here. Your Fermi pseudo potential here is given by this delta function. If you Fourier transform <coughs> a delta function, mathematically you end up with a constant. So what that means is that uh, uh, if you think about your uh, differential cross-section, it doesn't matter where you look, your object is a delta function, but it doesn't matter where you look in terms of angle here, you're always going to see the same intensity. Right, so this is isotropic. Your delta function gives you something that's isotropic. That means that you get no form factor for neutrons. Right, this is not true for x-rays. In x-rays, uh, you would have an object that was much, much larger with respect to your wavelength, and you would have to take into account the Fourier transform. Yep. 
you can use exactly the same derivation for x-rays. But it's less quantitative in the sense that um, the interaction of x-rays with matter is usually a lot stronger than the interaction of neutrons with matter. So neutrons are very, very deeply penetrating. You can. <laughs> yeah, you can, do it, you can do exactly the same thing for x-rays. This is true of scattering. Right? Up until this point here, where I put in a delta function, all the stuff I spoke about previously with the first Born approximation, that applies for any wave, uh, well, any quantum wave. So it would be uh, uh, x-rays, electrons, uh, neutrons, even larger atoms like helium atoms and things like that. All the same mathematics applies. The question is how valid is the first Born approximation? So if your probe, whatever it is, interacts strongly with your sample, and x-rays interact much more strongly with your sample than neutrons do, then the Born approximation breaks down. It doesn't work as well. But you can use exactly the same <coughs> mathematics. And in fact, if you're, if you're looking at something like thin films, then people often use the, uh, the Born approximation to, to try and treat that. Right? The, the samples are very thin. Uh, so the penetration depth of the x-rays is, is uh, almost over the entire sample. It's a better approximation. But if you've got a large sample, then the first born approximation will not work very well for x-rays. And it doesn't work at all for electrons. Electrons interact very strongly with your sample. Uh, but for neutrons, it's very good. All right, so that was for one, that was for one uh, uh, nucleus. Now, if I take a number of nuclei and I put them in some sort of crystal structure, right? So here's a lattice of nuclei, square lattice. Uh, they're spaced by some distance I'm going to call A. If I Fourier transform that, I'm going to get another square lattice. But now the distance between these points is going to be 2 pi divided by A, right? For that reason, Fourier transformed crystal structures are often called reciprocal space. Uh, and from this, you can derive Bragg's law. It's another way of thinking about it if you start considering vectors. So this leads to Bragg's law. If you consider an actual experiment, you'll have some beam coming in with some sort of momentum. And that gets changed into a final k vector, final momentum. There'll be some angle between them. You have some theta coming in and some theta coming out. If you take these two vectors and you draw them on reciprocal space like this, and you take into account that what you're measuring is q, then k, the incident minus the final k, gives you q. In order to see any sort of scattering, this final vector has to hit some object in reciprocal space. If it doesn't hit that object, you don't see any scattering. Now, in this particular case, we've lined it up so that that angle there is 2 theta, and that's given by the length of these vectors. And you're joining up some origin here to some reciprocal lattice point. If you go through the mathematics, you realize pretty quickly that this 2d sine theta must be equal to the wavelength. That leads eventually to Bragg's law. There's a little exercise for you if you want. Uh, if you put in the correct uh, expressions for the length of these things and you work out the vectors, that leads very quickly to that. So then your, uh, and then if you work out the Fourier transform squared, which gives you the amplitude of this, uh, of this, uh, uh, um, of this scattering event, this Bragg, uh, this Bragg peak, you take the modulus of this expression squared, you end up with B squared. So now we've quantified how many neutrons, or the, the probability that we'll see neutrons in this peak. It's going to be given by the coherent scattering length squared in that case. That is actually one way of determining what B is. If you get a very highly pure compound, and you do a very careful experiment, and you measure the intensities of these Bragg peaks, you're able to work out what the scattering length is. That's one way that people use to, to, to actually tabulate all of this. So what if the nuclei are not all the same, though? So uh, this is pretty straightforward if you've got a mononucleic uh, material uh, and you've got a very simple crystal structure. Most materials, though, don't have just one atom, one type of atom. They've got uh, a, a range of different types of atoms. Uh, so in that case, um, you then have to worry about what the ensemble average of B is. And in fact, in this case, it's the same sort of expression as previously, but instead of having uh, sort of a sum over a single type of I, I have to worry about what the individual Bs here are on each uh, of the sites. And there's a trick that you can apply in order to make this more tractable. What you do is you break it up into an average part and a variance around that average part. And that's exactly what people do. So you can take two parts to this. The first one is uh, you take the average of this bit here, um, and it's going to give you that quantity if the two are, the, uh, are not the same. 
and it's going to give you this quantity if the two are the same. And you have to worry about this. In the mathematics, this is a, a double sum. You do have to worry about I equaling J. Right? You can't ignore that. And if you work this out, then you'll end up with two parts of the expression. This first part here, right? these two are not the same. So you'll keep this R here as the distance between those two sites. So that R here stays, and you'll end up with something that again looks like a Fourier transform. And the amplitude of this is given by the average of your coherent scattering length squared. And then you've got this bit here, which is the variance around. Right, so this first part we call coherent scattering. That would be the intensity, or that would give you the intensity in your Bragg peaks. And the second part here is called incoherent. This is the random variation around some average value. And you'll notice as well that this first part here has a, a quantity Q. This is the momentum transfer. Obviously that matters if you're looking at a Bragg peak or not. This bit has nothing. Right, that's a constant. So the incoherent part scatters sort of isotropically, goes everywhere. And the coherent part is the intensity in the Bragg peaks. Right, now, if you, you go through this, there's some very, in, uh, very important quantities to do with this uh, incoherent part. There are essentially two ways that you can get uh, incoherent scattering. The first one is I mentioned earlier that, uh, in fact, you can see it even here, that you've got a nuclear spin that contributes to your scattering. Now, the nuclear spin uh, is generally randomly oriented. If you cool your sample down to a very, very low temperature, you can get the nuclear spins in some materials to line up. But generally, the, uh, the temperature that you need is so incredibly low, I'm talking about nano-Kelvin, that for any conceivable temperature you're ever going to measure, these things have got too much thermal energy and they're just wobbling around everywhere. So that thermal spin orientation is random as you go from nucleus to nucleus. You've got some materials where that gives you a lot of incoherent scattering. And the worst one for that is hydrogen. Right, so hydrogen... If you look over here, you've got this incoherent cross-section here, right beside the coherent one. So the, co the coherent one is about 1.75. The incoherent one is 80. That's absolutely enormous. And that's a big problem for neutrons if you're measuring, uh, uh, if you're measuring samples with hydrogen. Uh, they'll give you a lot of this incoherent background. It can make it difficult to, 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 to see what's going on. Uh, and there are two tables here. So you've got uh, this this one here which is in the, the data booklet this is also a, a very good reference to find tabulated uh, uh, cross sections and, and um, scattering lengths uh, you can also see here just while I'm on it that you've got the difference in the coherent scattering length one's minus 3.7 which is for a proton the other one's 6.6 .6. so the power of, of being able to swap between protons and deuterium is, is very clearly shown by the contrast here but the downside is you do have to worry about this Another way is if you've got uh, different isotopes. So here, obviously, we've got two isotopes, and they've got very different scattering lengths. And if you haven't bothered to try and isotopically enrich your sample, then uh, you'll get some random distribution of these, and that will give you incoherent scattering as well. It doesn't matter too much for hydrogen, because 99.985% of natural hydrogen is protons. And it's only 0.015% of natural hydrogen is deuterium. So generally, you don't have to worry about this incoherent scattering from the different types of isotope for uh, hydrogen. But you do for a compound like nickel, or a, an element like nickel. So nickel here, uh, it has effectively no nuclear spin, and it has no uh, nuclear spin incoherent scattering. But you've got quite a lot of isotopes, and there's a reasonable percentage of each with a massive contrast. So here, you've got 68% of it has this BC of 14, and you've got 26%, which is about three. So that's a big contrast, and they're randomly throughout your sample. That gives you quite a large uh, incoherent scattering. It's nowhere near as big as hydrogen, of course, but five is not insignificant, five barns. Okay, so uh, I've spoken so far pretty much about nuclear scattering, and I would like to uh, finish today, in the time that I've got left, uh, to talk a little bit about magnetism, right, which is a very important part of neutron scattering. That's a major reason uh, in fact, one of the early triumphs of neutron scattering was uh, being able to establish uh, the, the presence of something called antiferromagnetism. Uh, and that is the magnetic properties of your sample. So I want to talk a little bit about this interaction here, how the neutron interacts with magnetism inside the sample. All right, so it interacts, as I mentioned earlier, through dipole-dipole interactions. So if you have a, a bar magnet here, for example, with a north end and a south end, and you may have done this even in primary school. You put a piece of paper on the top and you sprinkle iron filings around it. And you'll see that the iron filings will align themselves with these magnetic field lines. 
And this is a dipole. It has a north end and a south end, two ends. It's a dipole. You can also get the same type of uh, magnetic field lines if you consider a current loop. So if you have uh, electrons going around in a, a loop like this, they'll generate the same type of dipole. And the neutron comes into that. The neutron is a dipole itself, and you have an interaction between this dipole and whatever the, the, the dipole moment is inside your sample. And then you're able to then uh, uh, work out the magnetic properties of your sample based on that. So this is a, a little bit more elegant in terms of the potential. So I mentioned earlier that the, the, the Fermi pseudo potential is uh, it's an approximation, which works very well. And we've got no real way of uh, calculating explicitly what the coherent scattering length is. That's not true for this dipole-dipole interaction. All right, so most magnetism is due to the electrons in the material. Electrons generate magnetic fields. The electronic currents, if they're moving around, or alternatively, uh, there's magnetism associated with the spin. And this potential here, this is a, an explicit expression. It's a dot product between two vectors. You have to worry about the direction of the spin on the neutron, and you have to worry about the direction of the magnetic induction inside your sample. The magnetic induction is created by these electric currents, and it's generated by uh, this electron spin. And that's, a, that's an explicit expression. It works pretty much all over physics, in fact. It's, uh, it, it's very elegant. You can plug that now into your Fermi pseudo, uh, not, sorry, you can plug that into your potential and you can solve for what the probability of scattering should be. But it's more complicated than the Fermi pseudo potential because now you have to worry about directions. Previously, I just had a scalar, which was the, 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 the size of B. Now I have to worry about which direction is my B pointing in and which direction is my neutron spin pointing in. Again, getting back to vectors. So electrons for a start, and this again gets to what I was saying earlier about uh, uh, X-rays and the size of X-rays. Electrons are distributed in space, and they're typically about the same size in, in their spatial distribution as an atom. Right? So for that case now, you can't consider that you've got a delta function sitting inside your plane wave. Now you have an object that's relatively large with respect to your incident wavelength. You take the Fourier transform of that, and you'll end up, so this will be your electron distribution, all right? In, in, I've drawn it, this is a, a one-dimensional plot, but obviously, eventually, the thing's in three dimensions. If I Fourier transform that, then I'll end up with something that also has a shape. So I'll end up with something that you would call a form factor. It's to do with the spatial distribution in these electrons that are contributing to the magnetism inside your sample. You get the same sort of thing with x-rays, or conventional x-ray scattering. Uh, these things are all tabulated, right? They're a bit different to x-rays in the sense that x-rays see all of the electrons. Neutrons will only see the electrons that are contributing to the magnetism. So this form factor that you eventually get looks a bit different to what you might get for, uh, uh, for, for x-rays, but they are tabulated. So you can go and look up uh, Jane Brown's work in the International Tables of Crystallography. And uh, depending on how the uh, electrons and the, electron, the, the magnetic orbitals are distributed around your, your sample, uh, you'll get these different terms and you can add them together to create what your form factor will eventually look like. Uh, so the important point to remember here is that nuclear scattering has no form factor, but magnetic scattering does. The next thing, and possibly the most important thing about uh, neutron scattering from magnetism is... Uh, to do with the directions of Q, which is your momentum transfer, and the direction of the magnetism inside your sample. All right, so if you have an electron that's contributing to the magnetism, there's typically two ways that it can contribute. One is that it's moving. All right, if it's moving, it will generate, it's a charge that's moving, it will generate a magnetic field. And the second is it's got this spin, which generates a magnetic field as well. Those are the two contributions. So if you follow through the mathematics, and I'm not going to do it, I'm just going to show this to you very briefly. If you want to know more, this is described very nicely in Gordon Squire's book uh, in Chapter 7. He goes very explicitly through all the mathematics. But he eventually gets through these two different contributions, these rather complicated-looking expressions with lots of cross-products between vectors, uh, uh, all sorts of things. Cross-products, you have to go into a little bit of how, about, uh, how you multiply vectors together. But the important thing about cross products is if you have two vectors, 
The result of a cross product is you'll get a vector that's perpendicular to those two vectors. And if you follow through this very carefully, you realize that, uh, well, let's go with this one first. You've got some momentum, your electron's moving in some direction. Q must be perpendicular, uh, sorry, Q, um, the cross product of, of Q with, with uh, momentum will give you a final result here, which is perpendicular to both. And it turns out to be the contribution of the magnetism here, which is perpendicular to Q. Uh, in fact, in this case, it's, um, it's got to be out of the page, in this case. Whoop. I've, I've gone the wrong way. Hang on a second. And the same thing comes about with this one here. Eventually, once you work through all of this, you work out that you've got the component here of the magnetism that's perpendicular to Q. In both cases, if you work through the mathematics, you find the, math the magnetic parts, oh, I'm doing it again. The magnetic parts are both perpendicular to your momentum transfer Q, and this is the most important thing to take away from magnetic scattering. The neutrons only ever see the components of the magnetism that are perpendicular to the scattering vector Q. All right, so what does this mean for something like Bragg scattering? All right, if I return to this example here, I've got uh, something like a crystal structure. On each of these crystal structures, uh, on each of these positions now, instead of putting uh, an individual nucleus, I'm going to put a dipole. The dipole is the direction of the magnetic moment on each of those atoms. Okay, I'm still sticking with Bragg's law here. What we often do is instead of putting little bar magnets, is we'll draw vectors. And the length of this vector, mu, that's the size of the magnetic moment on each of those atoms. And they're all pointing in some sort of certain direction. In this case, they're all pointing in the same direction. Your sample, of course, can be much more complicated than this. If I go back now to this example here, previously, if you did the, uh, if you did the uh, uh, experiment, then um, all of these Bragg peaks for the nuclear scattering, all of them would have exactly the same uh, scattering probability, which was given by B squared. But now, you have to worry about the direction of Q, and you have to worry about the direction of this mu, which is the direction of the magnetic moment on the object you're scattering from. In this particular case, mu is pointing vertical, and so is Q. And neutrons only ever see the perpendicular components of the magnetism to Q. In this particular instance, there are no perpendicular components of the magnetism to Q. So even though in reciprocal space, this is an allowed position for scattering, this should give you a Bragg peak. It would give you a Bragg peak if it was nuclear scattering. For magnetic scattering, you see no contribution because you only ever see the perpendicular components to Q. However, if I did exactly the same experiment, but I rotated my crystal 90 degrees, then I would see all of the magnetism. Now my Q is perpendicular to mu, and I would see all of the magnetism in my scattering. So in that case, my scattering comes out as mu squared, and I put a little perpendicular there to say it's the perpendicular component of the magnetism inside my sample to Q. And of course, you have to worry about the form factor. You have to worry about uh, how long Q is. And that will then reduce your intensity as you go further and further out in Q. Right, so uh, I was now going to, uh, well, okay, so just to, to say, I'm going to ignore this pretty much for the moment. Um, the other thing that you can, of course, change is uh, the spin on the neutron, but I'm not going to talk about that today. You probably have uh, more discussion on that for, um, uh, for, for uh, spin polarized neutrons or, or yeah, spin polarized neutrons later on during the course, I think. Uh, what I did want to talk about a little bit was inelastic scattering. So everything I've spoken about so far is diffraction. Um, and now um, I am going to talk just a little bit about inelastic scattering. And again, it becomes easier to think about what's going on if you treat these things as vectors. So in this particular example here, just returning to Bragg's law, the length of this vector and the length of this vector are the same. Right, in this particular case, I would see Bragg scattering. Uh, here I've joined up this position with this position in reciprocal space with my Q, and I would expect to see scattering from there. If I have inelastic scattering though, the length of my final vector is no longer the length of, of my initial vector. What I've done is I've changed energy which is equivalent to changing the length of this. And then if I did exactly the same thing and I had inelastic scattering, that is what my, what we call scattering triangle would look like. 
Now I've got a leg coming out which is shorter. My sample has taken some of the energy from the neutrons. The angle has stayed the same, but the length of the vector has changed. My Q has changed here, and also my energy has changed. And they're, they're connected by these two, uh, these two equations here. This one here is the vector expression for Q. You can write a magnitude down like this, which is the, the cos rule if you go to, to trigonometry. Uh, and then you have an energy transfer. You can plot this if I fix what my incident energy is and I fix what my scattering angle is, then if I look in the inelastic scattering, I'm going to form some sort of trajectory through uh, momentum and energy space. I'll end up with pictures that look like this. Right? So in this particular case, I've done an experiment where my incident neutrons are fixed at 1.5, for example. Uh, and if I move my detector around, I'll be describing, I'm, I'm changing this angle here as I move around, and I'll describe a trajectory into my detector, which will look like this if I'm scattering in the forward direction. If I go to 90 degrees, it'll follow the green trajectory. Go to 180 degrees, which is backscattering. I'll go to uh, the cyan one there. Uh, if you go through all of this, then you, you realize pretty quickly that um, the neutron momentum and energy changes must be coupled. And you need to consider then in your scattering triangles what you can actually access when you do your experiment. You have to think about what the incident energy coming in is, what the final energy you want to probe is, and whether you can access that with the experiment you're doing. That will change the way that you do your experiment. With a lot of these sorts of things, then you'll, you'll want to know, if you wanted to do an experiment where you wanted to know what the energy transfer was happening at that particular point, you would actually have to change the way you did the experiment in this case. Right? Obviously, you can't fix that one because as you fix that one, this angle here, this direction of Q will start moving around. What you can do, though, is rotate your sample a little bit, which you have to do, and then you will be on the same position, but now I'm not measuring the elastic scattering here. I'm measuring an inelastic scattering event here. And what I would then have to do is rotate my crystal plus... Uh, I had to rotate my crystal plus change the, uh, uh, the lengths of Ki and Kf to be able to maintain what we call constant Q. And I'd do a, a spectroscopy measurement right here. I'll be looking at the energy change at that position there. If you do that, then, then things uh, start to look very complicated indeed. You end up with this great big sort of general expression, uh, which looks rather scary. It's the same sort of thing, though. Um, it's just that this bit here now includes inelastic parts. All of that part there, though, is much the same as what we had previously, but I've now included some inelastic terms. So again, it's a Fourier transform. It's a Fourier transform, but it's also in space. Uh, sorry, it's in space and it's in time. You have to worry about that. And in fact, you will often see this if you're a theoretician. You'll be very excited by something called S of Q and omega. If you follow through the same sort of thing, this is again using the first Born approximation, you get your inelastic cross-section is directly proportional to S of Q and omega. And this is extremely powerful because that's what theoreticians like to calculate. They will calculate explicitly what S of Q and omega is inside your sample and the neutron measures that directly. It's a quali quantitative probe that will give you S of Q and omega that you can compare directly to, uh, to, to uh, calculation. So Fourier transform in space and time. Uh, the Fourier transform of time gives frequencies. Right? So you go from real to reciprocal space with Fourier transform. But if you Fourier transform time, you'll get frequencies or alternatively energies. And neutron inelastic scattering is very good for measuring things like vibrations. So I'm just going to finish now with uh, uh, an example of what that means. Uh, and this is a very simple example of something we call a harmonic oscillator. Right? So if you have a ball, for example, sitting in a, or a skateboard in a half pipe and you had no friction, you could put the skateboard halfway up the half pipe and it would rock backwards and forwards inside the half pipe. There's plenty of other examples. You can have balls on springs, you can have uh, pendulums, and they all follow very similar sorts of mathematics known as a harmonic oscillator. It will just continue to oscillate with a certain frequency. In the absence of friction, it will do it forever. What you can do is if you solve this uh, just with a ball or skateboard and a half pipe, you end up with some frequency here. It depends on the shape of the half pipe. All right, so this case is a parabola. Um, you can use other shapes though. Uh, if that's the case, then you have this expression here, which is the potential. It's a similar th sort of thing to the potential we've been using for uh, neutron scattering. And then uh, if you solve for all of that, you, you get this expression here for the frequency that tells you what the shape of your 
of your half pipe is. That's classical. That's if you put a ball inside a, in, inside a, a tube. Right? If you go to quantum mechanics, things get a little bit more complicated. And of course, if you're looking at your sample, you're in the quantum regime. Doesn't matter, doesn't matter what you think about it. If you're looking at things on the size of an angstrom or a nanometer, you're in the quantum regime. And this is the sort of thing that, uh, uh, that, that you see in that case. Here, I can put my ball at any position up the, the pipe and I'll let it go and it will just roll backwards and forwards. Quantum mechanically, though, this is not allowed to happen. What happens is that the, uh, your object is only allowed to be at certain positions inside your, uh, your quantum well, in this case. And the positions are given by this expression here. This n is an integer. So it can only be here, or here, or here, or here. And you can see that with neutrons. What happens is the neutron will come in, and it will give just enough energy to kick your object up from, say, here to here. And what you should see is a, a peak in your intensity when the neutron comes in and it, it, uh, it gives just that amount of energy to the sample or receives just amount of energy from the sample, what you'll see is a peak in the scattering. So here's an example where they actually did this. Uh, this is a, uh, a compound of uranium nitrogen, uranium nitride. Uranium is very big, it's very heavy. Nitrogen is very light. There's a massive difference between the weight of these, th these two things. So if you like, the, the uranium is huge, it's got a lot of momentum, it doesn't like to move very much. You need to put a lot of effort into it to make it move. And the nitrogen's rattling around inside. In fact, you'll find a, a nitrogen atom in the middle here that's sort of rattling around inside this sort of uranium cage. It's like a ball trapped inside one of these potential wells. The neutron comes in, gives a bit of energy to this, or receives a bit of energy to that, and what you'll see is a peak in the scattering associated with these energy wells. And that's exactly what's seen. So the neutron has come in, and it's kicking the neutron, uh, it's kicking the, the, the nitrogen up or down uh, some of these uh, ladders, if you like. They were even able to then work on this and work out what the shape of the potential should look like inside. It turns out to be a very elegant way of working out the potential seen by this nitrogen atom on the inside there. There's another example here, which is uh, if you have a methyl group uh, attached to, uh, in this case, it's a uh, sodium acetate trihydride. Right, so the methane sits inside the material. It's got an arm on it, carbon, three hydrogen atoms associated with the end. Naively, you imagine it could rotate around like this. Right, it could be like a windmill attached to the end of uh, some stick. Because of its environment, it, it's not allowed to. It's in some sort of uh, state where the methyl group wants to lock into a certain position. And you might say, all right, well, it's got to lock into that position, but if it's got enough energy, you should be able to get it to rotate between different positions on this, right? So if this is your methyl group, you've got a hydrogen here, a hydrogen here, a hydrogen here. You should be able to just flip between these and it should cost you no energy. In fact, this is known as, as tunneling. What will happen is that the whole thing will just spontaneously switch from one to the other. Uh, what happens though is that because of quantum mechanics, the hydrogen atoms, these wave functions will overlap a little bit. So it does cost you just a tiny little bit of energy to swap from one orientation to another. To, to actually turn these things around, like uh, hands of a clock, I guess. And you can measure that with neutrons as well. So here, this is what's called the elastic line. But these ones here, that's the amount of energy that is cost to get for the neutron to come in and to push one of these, or to, to rotate the methyl group around one click along these three things here. What's kind of nice about this as well is if you look at the energy here, that's in microelectron volts. The previous one is... Uh, up to 500 milli electron volts. So that also gives you an idea of what the energy scales that you can, you can look at. Very, very big energy scales here, very small energy scales there. Then, of course, there's uh, things like propagating lattice vibrations, things like phonons. Right? So if you take a, a bunch of balls and you attach them by springs, and you take a ball at one end and you give it a shake, you'll get something like a wave that will propagate along that set of, uh, that set of springs. Right? So you can take one ball and you can push it. If you push it, you'll create a compression wave. And the compression wave will move along that, uh, uh, that set of springs there. If you look at the frequency of that wave and the wavelength of that wave, you end up with an expression here between the two of them, which goes as this sort of sine squared. And that k there is the, uh, associated with the wavelength. A is the distance between the two ball positions. And uh, you'll end up with an expression here which is called the dispersion relation. It relates the energy of the wave with the wavelength of the wave. You can also take a ball at one end, you can shake it to the side. If you do that, this is called a longitudinal wave. Here you've got a transverse wave. And now you'll get your transverse wave moving along. You end up with the same expression. 
for this what's called dispersion relation here. And the same thing is happening inside any solid material at any reasonable temperature. You've got uh, atoms that are vibrating and you'll get these atom waves, atom, atom propagation waves that are going through your sample. In fact, sound waves are, are basically this. So if you plot this phonon dispersion, uh, then here you've got effectively units of wavelength. Here you've got your energy. Uh, it sort of goes up to some sort of maximum here. Because it's periodic, eventually it comes down the other side. This is the dispersion relation uh, that you would expect to see for motion of atoms inside your, your, your compound. And because it costs you a little bit more energy to push a sample against one another, you've got springs in there. As you compress the spring, it costs you a little bit more energy. If you shake the spring, the amount that the spring expands and contracts is a little bit less. So the transverse, which is where you shake it from side to side, costs you a little bit less energy than the longitudinal one. The longitudinal one is when you push them, costs you a little bit more energy. You see, in fact, two sets of these phonon branches inside the material. Now, if you want to know this, the direction of K matters. So you have to set up your experiment so that you really are looking at how you, you look along this direction, for example. You would have to set up your experiment so that your triangles would be doing these sort of scans along energy by changing the length of this. And you'd have to rotate the sample and you'd have to change the length of these vectors so that you would be scanning out both momentum and energy. And if you do that, and I'll return to this uranium nitride thing. And here, if you look at the energy scales, I'm now down to much smaller energy scales. And you can see these phonon modes here. These are the, uh, the, the propagating sound waves inside the material seen with neutrons uh, on a very different energy scale to, to, uh, to what was there previously. What I'll also say, though, is that this sort of thing can be calculated from first principles. You can go and look at the sample and you can say, OK, what is the strength of the springs that are joining my atoms together? I want to calculate what, what, my, uh, uh, what my neutron scattering should look like based on that. And you can do it. And we'll work out uh, explicitly and we'll also work out quantitatively. And I think it's about the only probe that you can really do that consistently over a whole range of, of uh, techniques. So with that, I just wanted to summarize. It is now lunchtime. Uh, so essentially, this whole expression here, which looks rather scary, I want to get across that this is essentially based on the first Born approximation, which I told you about earlier. Uh, you have uh, plane waves, you have a weak perturbation, and then this becomes quantitative. You're able to take something from theory and calculate exactly what your neutron scattering should look like, and the two should compare directly. It gives an absolute value, uh, and it holds very, very well for neutrons. It's perhaps the only technique that's able to do that. And if you use it, you can then once again access all of this different types of science. Now with that, ladies and gentlemen, it's lunchtime, well and truly. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'll see you tomorrow.